Welcome to our service to celebrate the life and the testimony of Bert Seville. It's good to see so many of you that are here today to uh, support the family, to encourage them, and to let them know that you are uh, praying for them during this time of grief, but also a time of rejoicing as we celebrate Bert's uh, transition to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. I want to begin by opening in prayer, and then I will read uh, from some scripture. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, again, we want to express our gratitude to you for the life of Bert Seville, for the way you worked in his life, for the transformation power of the gospel and your word for his love for you, for his love for the word, for his love for the gospel, for his love for your grace and his great passion to tell people about the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that today as we reflect upon his life and his memories and we reflect upon what you have revealed to us in your word, that God the Holy Spirit would comfort us and that we would understand that great joy, the tranquility, contentment that is ours, that even in the midst of sorrow and sadness, we can rejoice because we know the truth that Bert is face to face with you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go over to visit with, with Bert, and it turned out that it was only five days before the Lord took him home, or maybe four days. And it was a great opportunity, a great time to visit with him, to joke. I lo love to tease Bert a little bit. I told him that, that um, when he got to heaven, he'd have a perfect body. And therefore, because heaven is perfect, that God would be serving tamales for breakfast. And <laughs> because he had a perfect body, he would love Mexican food. <laughs> And he just laughed and laughed, and we had a, a great time together and a good time with the family, and we talked about uh, what he wanted at his uh, memorial service, at his celebration, the focus on the Word. And so one of the things that he said was he wanted Psalm 15 to be read. I said, What's, what would you like to have read? And he said, Psalm 15. And I was glad it wasn't Psalm 119, but <laughs> it's a short one, and I'm going to add about four verses from Psalm 39 to it. Psalm 15, a psalm of David. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eye a vile person is despised. But he honors those who fear the Lord, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. And then Psalm 39, 4 through 7. Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best state is but vapor. Selah. Surely, every man walks about like a shadow. Surely, they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. I want to read a tribute to Bert. This was written by one of Bert's longest, longtime friends, Wendell Bell. Wendell always comes down here for the pastor's conference, our Chafer Seminary Conference in March, and I've gotten to be uh, good friends. And he would, uh, he's always tells me stories about Bert, uh, along with the same stories that Bert told me. So they, they agree with each other. So I know that there's, there must be some truth there. 
But Wendell uh, is a doctor and he works uh, contract work and works in a hospital up in um, Wisconsin. And so he was unable to be here for this service. So he wrote this tribute to Bert and asked me to read it for you. Bert Seville, my great friend and Christian brother for over 50 years, died on Monday, 20 November 2017, after a brief battle with melanoma. My condolences to his wife, Linda, and to uh, his four children, Rob and Jeff and Alicia and Rachel, and to their spouses, Edie, Larry, and Scott, and to his six children, Zach, six grandchildren, Zach, Leela, Hannah, Carly, Jade, and Mia. When Bert's body gave out, his soul and spirit passed from this life into eternity to be in heaven with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Saying Bert is now in heaven is not just a euphemism, not just a trite saying that people often apply to the departed, but it's based on certain facts which Bert would have you know. Bert was born in Scotland and came to this country when he was in his teens. In Scotland, his family was poor and often did not have enough food. Many of you have heard the story of Tommy, Bert's pet ferret, who Bert taught to hunt for rabbits and supplied food for the family during the rationing of World War II. As a young boy in Scotland, to attend school, Bert had to walk a long distance from his home to catch a train to another town where the school was located. He often had to walk back home in the dark. Bert tells the story of walking home one night in the dark when there was a clear clear sky and millions of stars were visible. He remembers thinking, someday I want to know the one who created all of those stars. And indeed, God honored this positive volition toward him at the time of God consciousness, and Bert later came to know this creator in a personal way and is now with him. Bert would want you to know how we know for sure that Bert is with his creator. After Bert came to this country, he, his formal schooling essentially stopped, and he began working various jobs. He eventually settled in New Hampshire and for a number of years worked for a man who taught him carpentry. In those days, Bert was known as Scotty. For the rest of his life, Bert earned his living as a carpenter in the building trades, eventually working for himself. But Bert never had just one job. He always worked several jobs and worked very long hours, seven days a week. He not only had a regular job or some contract job, but worked side construction jobs. He cleaned the local bank with the help of his family and in the winter plowed snow. Bert was multifaceted. He was a natural athlete and excelled at whatever athletic endeavor he tried. He was a champion bowler. He was an accomplished fly fisherman. He was a great duck hunter and a very good tennis player. He was a good shot with his 1911 45 In later life, Bert became a low-handicapped golfer, playing golf until just a few weeks before his death, and he regularly beat younger men in his league. In his younger years, Bert was, um, for a brief period, an amateur boxer, and he never lost his ability or tendency to use his fists and would physically fight anyone who got his Scottish hackles up threatened him or his family. When a man threatened to report Bert for child labor because his children helped him clean the local bank, did he make you all do that? (laughs) Bert showed him his fist and told him to go ahead because he knew where he lived and would give him his fist if anything came of it. (laughs) And Bert was not making an idle threat. (laughs) Even into his 80th decade, Bert was quick to take offense at anything that that he did not think was right and would express his disapproval in a loud, booming voice and sometime become physically threatening, as some of you here may have experienced. He would usually later apologize and become fast friends with the offender, but not always. Bert loved music, especially big band music. One of his favorites was Glenn Miller's In the Mood, 
And Bert was a very good dancer. He was an especially accomplished jitterbugger. Watching Bert and Linda jitterbug was a delight. Bert and Linda would move in quick jitterbug fashion, and Bert would throw Linda over his shoulder and over his hip and between his legs. It was a sight to behold. Bert was a passionate man. He did everything with enthusiasm. He never moved at normal speed. He always moved faster than anyone else, and trying to work with him or keep up with him was nearly impossible. Before he was a Christian, Bert was a hard drinker and lived, a life, lived life to extremes. There were not enough hours in the day for Bert to do all the things he wanted to do. Bert was also a very gregarious man. He would strike up a conversation with anyone, and soon they were talking and laughing with Bert's booming laugh dominating. And if you were friends with Bert, he would likely greet you with a big bear hug, and Bert was a bear of a man. Bert was an extremely strong man, and sometimes Bert did not realize how strong he was. Being hugged by Bert sometimes came close to being crushed. <laughs> Bert was also devoted to his wife, Linda, and to his children. They had a wonderful family, and their home was always open to guests. They loved to entertain and did so frequently. Bert was one of those men who was difficult not to like. He was someone who most people would call a great guy. In those early days, over 50 years ago, most people would have extolled Bert for being a very hard worker. He was a great husband, a wonderful father, and a loyal friend. In other words, people would say Bert was a good man. In those, and in those days, many people would have said that if anyone was going to heaven, it was Bert Seville. But they would have been wrong. Bert was a good man a great man, but he was not in his own goodness good enough for God. But God honored Bert's early positive volition at God consciousness when, as a little boy alone, one clear star-studded night in the quiet countryside of Scotland, he expressed his desire to know the Creator. Through the instruments of his cousin Ken and Virginia Johansson, and a little fledgling Bible church meeting in a school just up the street from the Seville home in Peterburg, New Hampshire, where Bert's children started attending Sunday school and begged Bert to attend church with them, Bert came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, trusting him and his saving work on the cross as the exclusive basis for his eternal salvation. On that day, Bert came to understand that he wasn't good enough that the Bible taught that none of us are good enough to meet God's perfect standard, that the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that all of our works of righteousness are as filthy rags. But he came to understand that it wasn't by works of righteousness that we've done, but it's according to God's mercy and his grace that he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. From the day that Bert believed in Jesus Christ as Savior, he was excited about his new life in Christ. And from that time, you could see a transformation, not just the fact that he had become a believer and a new creature in Christ, but he dedicated his life to the study of the Word of God. Within days of his accepting Jesus Christ as his Savior, Bert ended up in my Sunday school class. It was the beginning of the year, and we were starting a survey of the Bible, beginning at Genesis and going straight, straight through to Revelation. Our textbook, of course, was the Bible. Each week, I prepared a simple study guide with questions for the class members to complete in preparation for the next week's lesson. Bert was most conscientious about completing these lessons. Later, I learned that Bert had trouble reading and had never read a book. The first book he ever read was the Bible. And to complete the lessons, he had to use a dictionary and have the help of his older children who were about seven or eight years old. This was the beginning of Bert's love and learning of the Word of God. One of my favorite stories about Bert occurred just about two months after he became a believer and was attending my Bible class. It was February in New Hampshire on a hilly, very narrow, ice-covered, rutted dirt road. Bert was slowly driving up the hill, and I was 
cautiously, slowly driving down the hill. Bert slowed and eventually stopped to allow me to pass. I cautiously braked to slow down, but there was no traction because of the ice, and the ruts guided my car right into Bert's. Our driver's sides met, knocking out our respective driver's side headlights. Bert jumped out of his car with fists clenched and bellowed, It's a damn good thing I'm a Christian now. (laughs) Then I think he kind of caught himself and began to roar with laughter. In typical Bert fashion, when the police officer came to complete the accident report, Bert gave him the gospel. From the time he was a believer, Bert gave everyone he met the gospel. Within days of becoming a Christian, Bert went through the bank that he and his family cleaned, going from teller to teller, telling them he was now a believer in Jesus Christ and telling them why, he, why they should accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. He then went to the executive offices and witnessed to all of the executives. The vice president was so overcome with Bert's witness that he broke down in tears and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior right there. And then his wife and all his children became believers. That family are still fast friends of Bert and Linda. As some of you know, Bert passed out gospel tracts and witnessed to everyone he met, and perhaps Bert has spoken to some of you about your soul's eternal destiny. The best thing you could do to honor Bert would be to accept his Savior as your own Savior and someday meet Bert in eternity. Beginning with the completion of those simple study guides from my adult Bible class, Bert's love and learning for the Word of God was fantastic. And for the next 50 years or more, he never stopped learning and memorizing the Bible. And his knowledge and application of the Word of God was transformative. Bert had his thinking brought into conformity with God's thinking, and God transformed Bert's raw, rough-and-ready personality into something that reflected the character of his son, Jesus Christ. When it came to the Word of God, Bert literally put his money where his mouth was. Learning the Word of God was not just an occasional affair. He organized his life around it. Progressing from simple study guides, Bert and his family began systematically to listen to recorded Bible lessons of Pastor Theme from Houston. Bert then organized a Bible study in their wonderful home and had a telephone hookup with Pastor Theme's daily Bible studies. But eventually, Bert came to believe that he and his family needed more, and so he, along with Linda, decided to move their family to Houston for the express purpose of attending Pastor Theme's church to get daily Bible teaching live. He and Linda left their very comfortable home in New Hampshire and loaded what furniture they could on a truck and transported their four children and their black lab Libby to Houston with no definitive job or house to live in. And taking two high school boys out of their high school, the oldest Rob in his senior year, was not without being challenged and resisted. God provided both jobs and houses, and God worked in Rob's life as well. Bert would later tell this story through many tears. Though Bert was a tough fighter, he was also humbled and very tender-hearted. He would cry at anything that involved his family or his relationship with God. This move to Houston, of course, determined the trajectory of Bert's life and his family li- family's lives for the next 40 years. He and Linda and the children attended Bible class every night. Then, after Pastor Theme's ministry ended, Bert and Linda found their way to this church, West Houston Bible Church. West Houston Bible Church live streams on the Internet its Sunday morning services and Tuesday and Thursday no- evening Bible classes. Bert knows that I am tuned into these, and a number of years ago he began on Sunday morning after the completion of the service to come into the center aisle right back there and salute to the camera. These were salutes to me, and some of you have undoubtedly witnessed this at the church or online. As silly as it may be, because no one can, no one can see it, I always return the salute. Bert knew that if I did not see him and get the salute, I would call him to see why he wasn't in church. (laughs) Bert and I talked on the phone every week or so. My current job occasions long weekly drives, and I started talking with Bert on the phone during these drives. Sometimes we would talk for nearly an hour. I loved Bert. 
He was a man who loved God, who loved God's word, who was unpretentious, and who was free from legalistic religiosity. I will greatly miss Bert. I will miss our visits when I'm in Houston. I will miss our frequent telephone conversations, and I will especially miss his weekly salutes. And today I salute him and his Savior. I am confident that I shall someday see both in eternity. And Bert, if he were here, would invite you to make sure of your eternal destiny as well. He might repeat the slogan as he often did, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Thanks, Wendell. We'll salute you. Let's stand together. We're going to sing three hymns today. The first one is a favorite hymn for Bert and Linda, The Church's One Foundation. I don't have the number. Do you have the number? The Church's One Foundation. We'll sing all four stanzas. 277. 277. Please stand. when I was driving home from my sister's a little over a week ago after my dad had passed <clears throat> started thinking about his greatest at attribute he had so many the one that meant the most 
I think is the following. I hope you agree. Bert, the witness. As most of you know, Bert was no ordinary Joe. He was the witness. Not always the testimony, but always the witness. He was a loyal husband, a great father, a hard worker, a golfer, a fisherman, a friend with compassion for others, an artist, but always a witness. He loved competition, whether it was for work or play, but always a witness. His deep love and respect for Christ gave him hope, the hope of salvation to be the witness that he was. Love for family and country was also in the forefront of his thinking. Although, if you ask my mom, it was probably golf. <laughs> Most of you know what I mean about Bert being the witness. He likely talked to 100% of everyone here about his love for Christ at least, at least once or twice. He was never afraid to tell folks about salvation. <laughs> That's where anyone who truly knew my dad got his joy. He was the witness. Wherever I went in my travels, work or otherwise, people who knew Bert would ask about him. They sensed his compassion and joy as the witness. I'm so thankful that he was my dad, the witness. He is going to be missed dearly by friends and family, but we shall meet him again soon. I love you, Dad. What a wonderful gift our family received when Bert and Linda married, when Bert met Linda and married her in Dublin, New Hampshire in 1960. This beautiful relationship created and bonded a Christian fellowship and love for years to, co to come. I would like to start by saying that Bert loved each and every one of us in his own special way. And you know what that is if you ever met Bert. He was the most gracious, loving, kind, helpful, talented father and husband you could ask for. Bert was also very competitive in a good way. And this would always bring out the best in his kids and the people he touched in his life. One example was that I could never beat my dad in golf. Maybe out drive him, but not beat him. But the score didn't matter. Just the fact that you were on the golf course or paddling a canoe down a river with him or reading the Bible together kept all of us grounded in a special way with Christ in our hearts. I will miss being able to pick up the phone and ask him for advice on any topic, <laughs> whether it was construction, the way God wants us to conduct our lives, or anything in general. He was always eager to please. My dad's physical strength was very well known. We would always kid around and arm wrestle. One day, and this was only just a couple of years ago, <laughs> I knew there was something wrong when he overpowered me and all of us in the room heard two pops as my tendons let go and my bicep retracted. <laughs> he started crying and saying, what has happened and what have I done? And I said, don't worry about it, Dad, but you just broke my arm. I really think this happened as a reminder to me and maybe to all of us how strong he was and at the same time how spiritual he was. He was not the type to take no for an answer 
and a little overbearing at times. I think everybody can agree with that. But in the end, you always knew what, what is right and what is good. He loved his grandchildren dearly. <laughs> Zach, Mila, Hannah, Carly, Jane. He would call them all the time, or me all the time, say, when can I see the kids? That was Bert, full of love and life all the time. Bert had such a good work ethic, and no job was too hard as he was not afraid to get his hands dirty. Whether it was oil paintings, building fine furniture, he always surprised us with his talents. Bert's legacy and love for Christ is etched so deep in our family, and we all must continue to be a disciple for God's special plan for each of us. What a wonderful example of how a father and husband should lead his life. We love you and we'll miss you dearly. But look forward to that day when we can embrace each other again in heaven. My dad, my dad, Bert Seville, what a privilege I have as his daughter. I have a thing I call having a white bird day. One day, years ago, a white dove came and landed in a hanging plant I had by our front door. I grabbed my camera and took pictures, close-ups, through the glass door frame. I had to capture, time to capture several photos. I thought the dove looked a little tired and hurt. It had ruffled neck feathers and seemed to want to settle into the plant and sit a bit. It saw me there, but seemed too exhausted to care. Its eyes gradually closed. I wondered if it would die right there in that planter. I watched it for a while off and on. I didn't want to scare it off. So I would pass by and then observe it and leave. It kept sleeping and sitting there. Then it was gone. It must have recovered and flown away. <coughs> Ever since then, when I have close encounters with white birds, it's a white bird day. I had the privilege of many white bird observing days. I give thoughts immediately to the glory of God with each one. I consider them my symbolism of God's unfailing, complete, and pure love. They always give me pause and reflect and pray. Time to pray. I had, during this cancer journey with Dad, another white bird day. On my way out our back door to our car to leave for an appointment, I happened to look up there, flying by, were two of the most strikingly beautiful white egrets. Not one, but two. I count them for you, Mother, and for Dad. Whew. I lost my spot. It was all in such seemingly slow motion as they flew on by. I immediately thought as if God had slowly sent them by me on purpose at that moment. I was able to observe their ever slow motion of flight right in front of me. That moment was so beautiful because I had been dealing with hearing of my dad and his cancer diagnosis. 
The moment was so full of meaning for me, of everything I knew about God and whom I could trust in all things, even unto death. These birds are my symbols. I love birds. I cried over those two egrets that moment and what fullness of meaning they were to me of God's grace. I lean on those moments because God provides them to me to say, I've got you always. I needed it that day and God knew it. God helps me always and in particular on white bird days to stop, observe, and think to glorify him thank him for all he does for me. I'm refreshed, reminded, and go on with my day. That's no accident. It's truly God's grace. God's grace provided my dad for me. My dad, Bert Seville, Pardon me. Every person has a path in life. So many little things happen in our paths that make a life. Early on in the cancer diagnosis, we all decided we needed a book to pass around to keep notes and all pertinent information related to dad and his care. I chose this book. Right here. I was in the store. Rachel said, we need to get a book. And on the cover, I found it. It says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13. I chose the book because of the Bible verse gems in it. We had many moments when we were able to read those pertinent gems in it. They were so needed. So much goes through my mind about my father, my dad, Bert Seville. What a beautiful man, so photogenic, so youthful for most of his life. I used to tell him, Dad, you never age. You look the same, even as I was aware of the decades that were gaining on him. I felt, will my dad ever look old, like an old man the way I thought old men would look? Well, it did, in his body, but not in passion, in spirit, in drive, or zest for life. When you know someone, you know every body language, quirk, gesture, innuendo, expression of joy and frustration. You can begin to guess what they will do or say at, any, at many given moments. Not always, sometimes. You know what gives them joy and disappointment. You know their tastes and you can anticipate their reactions. Dad was a very outspoken person. Whatever he had on his mind, seemed to come out of his mouth. <laughs> he shared his thoughts very freely. We knew his politics, his sports of choice, even how he, he liked his hamburger, roast beef and eggs. Raw. <laughs> Practically, I failed the make an egg many a time. I couldn't get it quite right. He kept letting me try. Some contest did occur over how to cook it. Contests are rarely contests, mainly just opportunities to say, this is how I do it. <laughs> try it this way. <laughs> well, all... We all are that way, we Seville's. Try mine, or you're doing it wrong, <laughs> etc. We are a rambunctious crew who are going to have one less of us to razz just about anything. Dad, don't worry. <laughs> that tradition's not going anywhere. The Seville family razzing will go on. Dad and I had a favorite verse. We loved in common, many in fact. One, many recite and know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, 
and he will direct your path. Indeed, he shall. And this is what I am most interested to convey. I have remi- remained keenly aware through my life of Dad's story. Mine is intertwined and woven in there, and I am so thankful to God for it. I am a visual person. So this huge card was done many years ago in 1990. It's silly and abstract, but I didn't have a card for Mother and Dad's birthday, so I quickly painted an abstract one. I was 26 then. It was for their anniversary, September 10, 1990. It may not look like something to you, but Dad and Mother, when I showed it to them, it was the road through their life when they met and all the decisions they made to get to Texas. And at this time, they lived at a particular house on Mayard Road, and I I wrote, and still there today. It was for my parents' anniversary as a through the years recap card to celebrate them, remind them how far they have come. I know where this card ended then, where they lived at that time. Since then, this plan has been completed and done for you now, Dad, in my mind. I had the pleasure of knowing you as a daughter, to enjoy art classes with you, and Dad, this is show and tell time as well. Dad was such a good artist. He took up art in his early 20s, and this was his first still life that he ever created. It's a print of it. I have the original. We all have the original. <clears throat> he also did a, another painting after that in his early days. And there's a little short story behind it. This is me. (laughs) When I was little, Dad had been taking art classes. And he always told me the story of what happened, why this was never finished. But I love it. It's it's artistic to me, even though it never got finished. He um, started it, and he had a mantle in his master bedroom in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And the lights would come through the window at night. And mother and dad said that I had come in as a toddler and seen the painting on the mantel and screamed. (laughs) (laughs) So he just, he never finished it. But in my mind, it's finished. What this has all clearly taught me was how God's grace brought my dad through his boyhood to his eternal home. The grace gift of God did all of it, I know. God never leaves his children. We are his heirs. My heavenly father and my dad cared so much for me, first and foremost about my soul and that Jesus Christ, my Savior, died for me. Dad made sure I knew this. Dad also wanted me to grow in grace and knowledge and never stop doing it. I haven't, Dad. Thank you, Dad, for your guiding wisdom has guided my path and always will. I give all the glory. I give God all the glory for all of it. Dad's path and all of our family's path. Keep keenly and kindly aware of your path and dance like there's nobody watching. Dad did. Love like you'll never get hurt. Dad did. See, sing like there's nobody listening. Dad did. Live like it's heaven on earth. Dad did. Dad, I will cherish you more than you ever knew. I love you, Dad. See you in heaven. Love your daughter, Alicia. to follow that (laughs) Um, so uh, 
I'm gonna have to tell a story when Alicia's up here. So the last trip to the hospital. <laughs> um, my dad was going to Herman, and we found out he had cancer. And um, they said, I had a customer come in, and she was an Airstream customer. Last customer of the night, and I'm like, oh, crap. You know, here goes another tour. So, um, and uh, as you can tell, I, I sell RVs. So, and um, everybody wants to come in and see an Airstream. So I took her out, and um, we hit it off really well. And um, she, uh, we started talking, and um, she told me a little bit of her story. And she had lupus, and she had a heart condition, so she couldn't get a new heart because she had lupus. And um, and I started telling her about my dad, and um, I said he has cancer, and he's at Herman, and he's been going through all this stuff, and and she said get him out of there, get him to MD Anderson right away. So she told me what to do. She said, get the, get the, um, get a scan when you go to the hospital, get them to get you a scan. So long story short, um, I get the scan overnighted to her and, um, lo and behold, um, go back up. She, um, her husband is a neurosurgeon at MD Anderson. And she said, get him there. He's on call this weekend. He's never, he's, he's not on call, but every three months. So this to me was a sign from above. <laughs> and, um, so, uh, we went to, so I, he, she gets the desk. She texts me at, Melly texts me at midnight and she says, um, it's a text of his leg <laughs> instead of his brain. So, um, she said, go in the back door of MD Anderson. I'm going to get you in the back way to go get into MD Anderson because um, her husband, she had put it and um, kind of forced it to him that dinner and to look at the scan. So um, we, so the next day, I get off work at 5, I go to Alicia's house. I'm in my friend Kelly's car because we couldn't go in my little Fiat. And, um, <laughs> and so um, Alicia was mad at me because I had put Dad in the Lexus, the four-door car, instead of her car. <laughs> So she was a little bit out of fellowship, and um, <laughs> so um, she proceeds to get really pissed off. <laughs> I crammed Dad in the car. She wants the she wants the chair for him to sit on. I said, Alicia, they have wheelchairs there. We're going to take them into the emergency center. They don't have a real emergency center in MD Anderson. So she gets in the car. Leash and I start arguing, and my dad's in the front seat, and he goes, damn it, I'm dying to cancer, here, and you two are arguing, and um, <laughs> he goes, and um, so I'm zooming in the car, sorry, Aida, Kelly's car, and um, so, uh, and I'm, and I said, Leisha, if you don't change your attitude, I'm going to take you back, so I start driving back to the house, she goes, no, no, turn around, so he's like, you two apologize now, and um, so that was my dad. He was always the one to say, get it out, get it over with, and move on. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, Alicia. From the back seat, I hear, I'm sorry, too. <laughs> I didn't want to say I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. I'm getting there. So, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> he, um, I proceed to take off, and I'm in the, and I put in my phone, navigate to MD Anderson. Well, my phone takes me around all the quickest ways. So I head down I-10, it takes me off this route, and then um, I uh, go in the wrong way, and then on, and my dad takes a drink of water, he's back too far in the seat, he starts choking, I'm back, I'm trying to drive, trying to tap him on the back, Leisha's like, Leisha's like, he's breathing, he's just breathing drive. Your air, he's fine. <laughs> so um, he, uh, he gets calmed down. They're like, turn around. You need to go 610. So I turn around, get 610, and it's traffic. It's Houston. That's Houston, Hannah. <laughs> um, so uh, we get, um, <laughs> we finally get down there. Well, before we get down there, I, um, <laughs> dad's like, just go past the traffic. Just go down the, go down the breakdown lane. And I'm like, I'm in Kelly's car. I'm not going to hit debris in Kelly's car. So we get on 288 on MacArthur, and I, I'm hauling ass, I run a red light, <laughs> and then I get on another street, and I'm going over this bump, and my dad hits the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we pull up to the door at the emergency center, and my dad's like, thank God. 
And I couldn't say I was sorry yet because I hadn't rebounded and gotten in fellowship. So, and my dad on the way, <laughs> on the way down, he said, I love you, Rachel. And then um, he said, I love you, Alicia. And she nothing in the back, so, you know. And Alicia goes, and um, then we're almost there. And after the choking incident, Alicia finally says, I love you. And um, so my dad's like, well, it took you long enough. And that's... <laughs> <laughs> to make sure I was in fellowship. <laughs> so um, anyways, um, I'm sitting there. We finally get him in, and I'm signing on the paperwork. And um, Alicia's like, and I start laughing. She's like, what are you laughing about? And I said, well, the ride down here. <laughs> and, um, so um, anyways, that was, we, um, that doctor really helped us out in getting us into New Year's. And we gave us an extra week with my dad. But um, so I just want to say my quick sense, but... You can stay here. Um, but uh, that was just our la- Alicia and I's last ride with dad to the hospital was quite the ride. <laughs> but that was my dad. So I asked my dad what his favorite verse was, and he said he didn't have one. He would use the verse most appropriate for the situation he was in. So this verse to me says a lot about my dad and how he thought about the world and those around him. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. Ephesians six fourteen. He always stood his ground, and he didn't care who was around or who he might offend. His urgency about letting others know about God was above all else. He wanted everyone to know about God's body armor. One of the last times I spoke to him, I told him that he lived a life that leaves us all a life to live up to, very inspiring. Dad was the only one, when I called him, he would get so excited. His first question was always, how was your day? Did you make a sale? He was always the first person I called after sale. He was so excited for me. Dad was a carpenter, a painter, a poet, a golfer, a furniture builder, and one of the best, one of God's best recruiters. He called me one afternoon and I asked him, how was your day? He said it was good. I went to kickboxing class. (laughs) I laughed. My dad at 81 was taking kickboxing classes. (laughs) Six weeks ago, he was playing golf, and they used his ball as a marker after hitting it 265 yards. Not only was he playing golf, but he was completing a friend's remodeling job from the flood. He lived a life that no one could even come close to nowadays, lived through a war, saw many horrors at a very young age. He helped the nurses while he himself was in the hospital for lead poisoning. And as you heard, his favorite story to tell was his Tommy ferret, I mean his ferret Tommy, and who caught the rabbits for them to feed their family. My dad had a 10th grade education, but you would never know it. He could do math in his head and know the measurements just by looking. He frequently astounded us by how quick he would have something built. My dad was an emotional speaker (laughs) and would tear up when speaking about the Lord because he was so concerned about everyone's soul. For example, I've had had his phone for the past month fielding calls for him. And I received a call from a gentleman named Bert, who owns a pest control company. I had to tell him that my dad had passed. He, I asked him how he, uh, my dad had met. He said he was doing a job spraying for pest control. He said you and, he and his dad, he and my dad had the best laugh because they both had the same name and they both felt it the same way, B-E-R-T. Um, he said he was going to miss him even though he had just met him. And this was true for every story. I could go on for identical stories. In the bank, my sister and I went to go get our names on the account. Every single one of them in that bank wanted to take a picture with my dad. And they were hopping out to take pictures with him. (laughs) Um, And it was astounding to Alicia and I and made us think about how we live our lives and how we meet when we meet somebody and how we come across to them. Dad loved all his family and friends so much, and even people he didn't know. He wanted the best for everyone. He gave us the gift of no fear on how to live, love, and die. All right, at this time, we're going to stand. Follow that up with a uh, hymn. It's great that all those stories, you know, I'll talk about that in just a minute. We're going to stand and sing hymn number 43, Great is Thy Faithfulness, another 
favorite hymn of Bert and Linda's. just said says so much about your dad and it has impressed me during this last six or seven weeks that I have uh, either been at one I was at one and this is I think my fifth memorial service or funeral in a very short time and in four or five of these the children have come up and talked about their mother or father who's gone to be with the Lord. And it's just been tremendous. I don't th- I've never in years of being a pastor had this many uh, memorial service in this close a period of time. But the one thing that has struck me, should have struck you, because some of you were at some of these other services, is that when these children, adult children, talk about their parents, when they have a memory of their parents, that focal point is their love for the Lord. They th- when they think about their parent, they think about their love for Scripture. They think about their love for the Lord. They think about the fact, as Wendell said, that they organize their life around their spiritual priorities, learning the Word of God. 
And when we die, we don't get to take anything with us. Whatever your favorite things are, you don't get to take them with you. There's only one thing we get to take with us. And that's what we have in our soul that we've learned from the Word of God and our relationship with God. And we're going to go be with Him and our capacity to understand and appreciate where we are in heaven and to enjoy that relationship with God is directly related to how we grow spiritually during that time. And what a testimony it is that when we get to the end of our life, that what people remember us, they remember the great golf games or they remember the artwork or they remember their cooking But when they're asked, what do you really remember about your mom or your dad? They love the Lord. Now that's something we should all think about. Is that what our life is about? That's what the Apostle Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 2. He says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We're to live as Christ because that is the focal point of our life. When we come together at a service, I often talk about the fact that we're here for three things. We're here to remember the person. And we've done a remarkable job today being taken through Bert's life, coming to know him in ways that maybe some of you uh, did not know Bert. And you've seen dimensions of his life that that you weren't aware of. And, And he was just a tremendous individual. But his life was centered around the Lord. But as we think about those things, and we each have our special memories of Bert, that brings us to a time of sorrow because we know that we're not going to get a phone call from him. We're not going to be able to pick up the phone and call him. We're not going to wake up tomorrow and be able to go over and see him and get one of his great bear hugs. I'm not going to walk through the back door of the church and have him say, hello, laddie. I'm not going to get to tease him about, well, you know, at breakfast we need to be eating tamales and not just eggs and bacon. Bert would come down here. We have a men's prayer group that meets once a month. And we, he would always come down to help with the cooking. And he made sure that we always had grilled t- sliced tomatoes to go with our eggs. And I tried to make sure we would have tamales because I'm a Texan. And how can you have a good <laughs> breakfast without a little Mexican food? So we had a great time. But when, as I said, as we come together and we remember these things, we're, we're sad. Bert was in some ways just bigger than life, and so there's a, there's a hole there, and we miss him. I think about him when I come to church Sundays, Monday, Tuesday nights, Thursday night, that, that Bert's not there, and I miss him, and I know for the family, you just miss him greatly. He was such a big part of your life, and that's when we grieve, and what I want to talk about briefly is just these two things that are brought up by the Apostle Paul. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said to the Thessalonians, he said, We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. That's just a euphemism used in Scripture for believers who have died physically. That that body's just in a temporary resting place until the resurrection, and God puts it back together and gives us our resurrection body. Don't be uninformed about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. See, we grieve. doesn't say we don't grieve as Christians. Just because we know that Bert is in heaven and that he's in a place where there's no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain for these things have passed away. And we know that he's with his Lord and that he has a body and he has physical abilities and athletic abilities that he never dreamed of. We still miss him, and there's grief, and there's sorrow. But as Paul says, it's not like those who don't have hope. See, that grief is blended with hope, and it's blended with joy. And sometimes we think those are mutually contradictory emotions. But the Scripture says, no, they're not. We grieve. We grieve because there's a loss. And there's a reason that we grieve. We grieve because that wasn't what God intended for us to experience. He did not create human beings to go through 
the pain of death and the reality of loss because of death. That means that death and sorrow, sickness, suffering, these are not normal. They're normal for us on this side of Adam's sin, but that's not what God created man to be. One of the things that you often hear from people is, especially if they've gone through suffering or they've gone through the loss of someone they loved or some, something has happened traumatic in their life and that we're so self-absorbed, every one of us, that our initial feeling is like, why in the world could, did God let this happen to me? You know, it's just all about me and why did this happen to me? We ask this question, it's a big question. It's the question of how can a loving God let his creatures go through suffering? And we're not talking about minor suffering. We look at how certain things have just almost destroyed people's lives. All of us here have our own stories about going through Hurricane Harvey. Some of you are still not in your homes. Some people experience tremendous physical loss and financial loss because of a storm. There are many other things I could talk about that, that bring loss and suffering into our lives. And, and a reaction from what the Bible calls our sin nature is basically, how can a loving God let this happen to me? And maybe that's a question that some of you have asked or some of you may be asking. You know, Bert was just... Five weeks ago, he was out on the golf course and played 18 holes of golf. Bert was so full of life, and now he's gone. That just doesn't seem right. What I want you to understand is when you say in your soul, this isn't right, that's exactly how God wants you to feel. Because it's a wake-up call. He wants you to realize that there's something wrong with this world. This life is not what God intended for us. There's an episode in the life of Christ that took place not long before he was crucified where he was ministering with his disciples on the uh, east side of the Jordan River about 50 miles from Jerusalem. And he had a messenger come and say, "Your, your good friend Lazarus is about to die. He's very sick. Come and heal him. And many of us would think that if we had the power to instantly heal somebody of whatever disease it was, and they were about to die, that we would drop everything and run to their side and heal them. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus just kept doing what he was doing, kept ministering the way he was. His disciples said, well, well, Lazarus is going to die. And Jesus said, yes, he is, but this is for the glory of God. Just wait. A couple of days went by, and then Jesus said, okay, it's time to go see Lazarus. By the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead in the ground and in the grave for four days. And the, the mourners are all around and the family is grieving. And as he approached, La, um, Lazarus' sister Martha came out and she's, 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 she knows Jesus, who Jesus is. She knows she really shouldn't be condemning him. But then on the other hand... She, she wants to. It's like, Lord, if, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And the Lord looked at her and he said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. What a claim. No normal person would ever claim that they are the life. They embody life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he's dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he hit her between the eyes. He said, do you believe this? See, he was showing that there's a disconnect. Her confrontation of him was an act of not really believing that he was the resurrection and the life. And so she had to stop and she said, yes, Lord, I believe that. I believe you are the Christ. See, that's the issue in the gospel. That's the issue in eternal life. You've all heard this. Some of you have heard it from Bert. Some of you I know, many of you are believers in Jesus Christ. Some of you may not be. That's the issue with Christ. He makes this claim. Later he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now, who would make a claim like that? Who would come along and say, 
I'm the only way you can get to God. Now, a lot of people want to say that Jesus was a good man. He was a good teacher. But, you know, Jesus doesn't leave you with that option. Jesus doesn't allow you to go hide behind your rationalizations. When he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, you can't say, well, he's a good teacher. Because a good person isn't going to tell you they're the only way to heaven if they're not. Because then if you believe in them, then you're going to end up believing in something wrong, and you're going to end up in the lake of fire. That's not a good person. Jesus doesn't leave us the option of saying he was a good person, not if we're uh, intellectually consistent. Jesus, on the other hand, somebody who says, I'm the only way to heaven, well, maybe they're a nut job. Maybe they're off their meds for the day. Maybe they're psychotic. But the evidence that we have of Jesus is not the evidence of a person who was psychotic, who had mental health problems. Jesus is the most stable, focused person that's ever lived in human history. So that leaves you with only one option, and that is that he's not telling a lie. He's not self-deceived and crazy. He must be telling the truth. And so when he says this, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me, the way you appropriate that is by believing in him, which is what he said to Martha, believe in me. Now, right after they had that little confrontation, she walks with him back to the house, and the crowds are there. And then we have the shortest verse in the Bible. God, Jesus looked at the crowds, and we're told Jesus wept. And most of the time, you're going to have somebody say, see, Jesus is weeping for his good buddy Lazarus. But that's not what's going on, because Jesus is the God-man. He is omniscient. He knows that in 30 seconds, he's going to say, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus is going to come right out of that grave. And he's going to be alive again and as healthy as he ever was. So Jesus knows this. So Jesus is weeping for Lazarus. And if you read carefully, what it says in the story is that Jesus looked on the crowds. They were mourning. They were weeping. They were grieving. And because of what they were going through that morning, the pain, the heartache, Jesus wept. Because that wasn't God's intent. God created man. He put, them, put him in the garden. And he said, I'm going to, you've got free will. You can obey me or disobey me. If you, the only issue is don't eat from this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you choose to disobey me, there's going to be a consequence, and it's going to be death, spiritual death. But, and God didn't go into all the details that we know of, that spiritual death is going to bring all kinds of consequences. It's going to bring suffering into the world. It's going to bring misery into the world. It's going to bring all manner of disease and pestilence and war and heartache. But see, God wanted creatures who would love him out of their own free will, out of their own volition, freely, without being coerced. And so in order to have a creature that would worship him freely, he had to give them free will, which means they would have the freedom to succeed gloriously or to fail miserably. You can't have both ways and say, okay, I'm going to give you free will, but we're not going to have any bad things happen. That's why bad things happen to good people, is because Adam chose to disobey God, and it brought this misery. Well, God could have stopped it then, but then none of us would have ever been alive. So God allows human beings to continue to propagate from generation to generation until there will come a point when he ends that. But in the meantime, because he gives us free will, he gives us the opportunity to choose to believe in him and to follow him or to reject him. And he gives us that freedom and people use it in horrible ways. God could stop it. But if he did, that would end history. So there's a reason. We may not understand it. We can't comprehend it, Scripture says. But there's a reason why there's all of these horrible things. In fact, sometimes you may have heard people say to you, and you say, how can you believe in a loving God and all these horrible things happen? And you may think, well, I don't know. But you see, if you ask someone who's not a Christian, well, how do you explain it? They don't have an explanation. They just want to attack your view of God. 
But Scripture says it's very clear. God is in control, and he allows evil for its time. But we're to trust him that he knows what's best. He knows everything, so he obviously knows what's best. Bert understood that. He understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we're all sinners. Not one of us has any right to go before God and say, I did this, this, and this. You ought to let me into heaven because of that. Because God says we're all guilty. We've all sinned and fallen short of his standard. When it says we fall short of the glory of God, it's talking about his character. And so the only solution is that God would provide the answer, that God would provide us with that perfect righteousness. And he did that through Jesus Christ. Scripture says that he who knew no sin, that's Jesus Christ, sinless perfection, he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that the righteousness of God might be found in us. So that when we trust Christ, Scripture says, God accredits to us and gives us the righteousness of Christ. It doesn't mean that we're sinless, but it means that now we can stand before God because we're clothed in God's righteousness. And that covers up all the garbage that's in our life. It doesn't take it away, but we're saved because of Jesus' righteousness. And that's what Bert would want you to know this morning, that you don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's a free gift. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. And that's all we need to do is trust in him, just to believe. That's what the scripture says again and again and again. Just believe. That is the story. So we're going to close now with the closing hymn, which is a hymn that is dedicated to Bert by Linda. The hymn is, I Love to Tell the Story. And the, 297. it's 297 in your hymnal. And I am going to come up and close us in prayer after we sing the hymn. So please stand, number 297.
is why we have hope. Let's bow our heads together. Father, thank you for this time that we've had to reflect upon Bert. We love Bert. We love Bert because of what you made him to be, because of your grace in his life, because of the way that he spent his time focused upon your priorities, not his priorities, that he was an example in his good days when he's walking with you. He was an example to us of how we should share the wonderful story of your love for us and the true gospel of grace. Father, we're thankful for your, his love to Linda and to his children and to his grandchildren. And you pr we pray that they will honor that legacy, that spiritual legacy he has bequeathed to them to follow in those footsteps, walking closely with you. And that that walk will be a challenge to the rest of us as we examine our lives, wanting to make sure that when our life is lived, that that which stands out is our love for you, our love for your word, our love for the gospel. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The family wants to know that everyone's in, invited. We have some food out in the fellowship hall, spend some time together, tell some stories about Bert, and visit with the family. Thank you for coming.